As we continue our look at San Jose's literary culture, we hear from author John Markoff talking about the history between humans and computers in his book, Machines of Loving Grace. The name of the book is Machines of Loving Grace, um, the quest uh, for common ground between humans and robots. And I got into this book, I guess there's a specific reason and a broad reason. I, you know, um, I had been reporting on AI and robotics in Silicon Valley for the New York Times for a decade, and it just became uh, an increasingly hot, hot topic. The, the whole world became interested in robotics and AI, and they were having an impact, which they hadn't had before. You know, the field had always failed. Um, until it didn't fail and it began to succeed. And then um, specifically, I'd written an earlier book called What the Dormouse Said, which was about the prehistory of the personal computer, stuff that happened around, right around Stanford between 65 and 1975 that led to the rise of the personal computer industry and the, and the modern internet. And while I was doing that, I noticed right at the dawn of the era of interactive computing, sort of 1962, there were two labs that were created uh, equidistant from Stanford, actually. One was started by a man by the name of John McCarthy, and he was a well-known computer scientist at that time, and he'd actually coined the term artificial intelligence in 1956. And he came to Stanford and he created the Stanford um, Artificial Intelligence Laboratory in 1962. And his goal was to create a set of technologies that could essentially replace a human. Um, and he actually uh, got money from the Pentagon from this think tank called the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, which was sort of the blue sky think tank for doing advanced military research. And um, in his first sort of proposal, he th said he thought he could create a thinking machine in a decade. It would take 10 years to build a st what's called strong AI. So at the same time, on the other side of campus, there was another laboratory started roughly the same year by a guy by the name of Douglas Engelbart. And you probably know Engelbart because he invented the computer mouse. And his project was called the Augmentation Research Center, ARC. And, uh, his goal, he named it intelligence augmentation. So rather than replace the human, he wanted to extend the human. So on one side of the campus you had AI, and on the other side of the campus you had IA. And I looked at that and I thought it's a really interesting dichotomy, but it's also a paradox because if you uh, augment a human or if you extend their capabilities, you need fewer humans. And so the book is really my effort to kind of square the circle as much as it's possible. I'm actually sitting in front of a early uh, a pioneering, uh, they're called platforms, and its name is Shaky. It was probably the world's, it, it was the first, first truly autonomous robot. It was built to allow a, a new group of researchers to do basic research in AI, and out of it came a whole host of the technologies that almost everybody uses today. For example, you can draw a line from Shaky, the original research done beginning in the 1960s, to navigation systems, the kind of stuff you use in your smartphone to, to navigate with, and speech recognition. Some of the first speech recognition research was done on Shaky as a control mechanism. And uh, it, it uh, at the time, it didn't do much. It, it would move a little bit, and then it would have to look at the world, and it would move some more. Uh, but that's where it all started. So the two fields, artificial intelligence and intelligence augmentation, have really sort of gone their separate ways. And I think it's, it's basically um, the reason they haven't talked to each other is they have different values. The engineering groups, um, you know, the, the AI guys, they're in love with robots, they're in love with these systems, they're not thinking deeply about the consequences. They just want to, I mean, they want to perfect these systems and use them in powerful ways, and in some cases make money from them, but oftentimes they simply want to push the technology as far as they can, and then don't think so much about the consequences. I've found that the IA, IA developers really think clearly about what the ethics are of these systems and what the role of people is, and I think that's one of the reasons there hasn't been a lot of communication. As, as engineering disciplines, they have entirely different values. Now, I think, I give the field a fair amount of credit because as the machines have gotten more powerful, even these guys over on the AI side have realized that something is happening here that can really change society. And they're starting to think about it, and many of them are, are basically realizing we have to make ethical choices, and they're making the right ethical choices. Let me give you an example. Satya Nadella, the CEO of uh, Microsoft, has called his company an IA, an intelligence augmentation company. He wants to use, he says, AI technologies to extend humans rather than replace them.
What's interesting about the way AI has sort of accelerated into our lives um, is that um, it comes in at consumer price points now and we don't even notice it. Um, you know, going back to 2010, 2011, Steve Jobs put Siri at the very heart of the iPhone and now hundreds of millions of people use Siri. Um, you know, hundreds of millions of people use Google Home, hundreds of millions of people use Cortana, um, hundreds of millions of people use uh, Amazon Echo. Um, it just kind of slipped in there. And so that's one example. Uh, AI is underneath the fact that machines can increasingly listen to us and understand. Um, there's uh, software that Google offers for free called Google Translate which allows you to give it a document in any number of languages. And actually, Microsoft has a very similar service. Um, and it'll give you back a pretty good translation. Not perfect, but good enough, uh, which is really quite remarkable. Um, if you get in a modern car, um, uh, you know, I have a, a two-year-old Volvo, and it has a camera in it that has AI technologies inside it. It is able to follow lanes. It's able to make intelligent decisions. Um, cars like the Tesla have even more AI software. Um, there is a company called Mobileye, which is an Israeli company that supplies camera and sort of AI technology to many car makers. And over the next five to 10 years, I mean, cars will increasingly, I don't know if they'll completely drive themselves, but they'll increasingly do things that will perhaps protect us from our mistakes and making cars safer. Now that would be an example of an IA use of, uh, of AI technologies to make us safer rather than to replace us. Um, and, um, you know, there's AI technologies in modern cameras um, that basically sort of correct and improve your, your, your fo your, the photograph you take without you even knowing about it. Uh, so everywhere, even um, in modern weapons increasingly, AI technology is being de deployed. Um, there's a, a sort of a growing debate in society over whether AI systems should actually make killing decisions, but increasingly they're gonna be able to. So the entire range of human behavior is now being used by these, 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 these new, new types of devices. Going back as far as 1950, when computers first came on the scene, about every decade and a half, as a society, we start to get anxious about our relationship to machines. And it's usually about whether they'll take our jobs. And clearly, up until now, most of that automation has happened around blue collar jobs. Over a long period of time, going back you know, farther than the buggy whip, um, uh, machines have replaced human labor. What's interesting about this next shift is that machines are beginning to replace intellectual labor. And so people have seen this and over the space of three or four years there's become an intense debate in our society about the rate of change and some people have made the case, some computer scientists believe that the technology is moving quickly enough that People put the date at 2045 that there will be machines that are powerful enough to do all human jobs. I think that is wildly optimistic. Um, there are uh, lots and lots of uh, points at which you can say machines are starting to have an impact on society but, and the economy and on jobs. But you ha have to remember, um, there was a well-known uh, economist whose name was John Maynard Keynes, who in the 1930s wrote about automation. And at that point he said, um, technology replaces jobs, it doesn't replace work. And that's been true up until now. And some of the engineers are saying this time it's gonna be different, this time it's gonna re replace work. I think that's yet to be proven. Um, one of the really striking points that gets overlooked at right is right now in America, there are 145 million people working. That's more people at work than have ever been at work in America in history. So we've had 30 years of personal computers and all kinds of technology flowing into society and there's still more jobs. Now when I say that people come back and they say yes but the labor participation rate is declining. That's the you know the relationship of the size, the size of the working population, population and the number of people at work and I've looked at that very clearly and it's true. Um, it's not at a historic low but it is low but when you started to pick it apart and say, why is this happening? Why are people dropping out of the workforce? It's not about technology. It's mostly about things like my generation, the baby boomers are starting to retire. And there are other reasons. And it turns out that technology is way down in the stack. And if you look around the rest of the workforce, that's basically what's happening. Tasks are being taken over machines. Jobs will change. They won't go away. 
the question of whether we will be transformed as, as a species by AI, AI is uh, one that we need to start thinking about right now. Um, Alan Kay is a computer scientist who uh, was one of the pioneers of personal computing, and I think he has a really good way of thinking about the way um, we might either shape or be shaped in turn by these systems. Uh, he talks about the fact that you know we're increasingly living with these conversational systems that talk to us, um, and we have to make a decision about we're whether we're going to be their masters or whether they're going to be our masters or whether we're going, be, we're going to be partners. And I actually think that's a human decision, but increasingly um, we're going to be um, talking to these machines and taking advice from them. One of the things I actually worry about in terms of how humanity might be changed by this technology in relatively near term, I come from a generation that didn't want to take instructions from anyone. And now, if you're downtown in San Francisco where I live, half of the people are walking around the street looking at their palm of their hand. That's just this, now that can't be the end of progress. Some, something's got to come after that. But right now that's the way we interface with these machines. Um, you know, there's a generation of young people who take life instructions from the palm of their hand, they, whether uh, it's which Korean food to, to, to order or who to marry. Uh, and I think that that is pot potentially an insidious change. Um, right now, for example, uh, there's a kind of robotics called cloud robotics. One of the amazing things about internet connected robots is in principle, if you teach something to one robot or one robot learns something, they can all know it instantly. And humans don't learn that way. I mean, you know, getting information from one human to another takes a while. But if we're all interconnected, I mean, think about um, the Obama administration in 2014 started this something, something called the Obama Brain Initiative. And the goal of the Obama Brain Initiative is not only to simultaneously read from a million neurons in the human brain, but it's to be able to write to a million neurons in the human brain. And that raises the possibility I mean, it was, it's been totally science fiction, but people are starting base, basically to, to, to touch on the idea of control. Maybe it's passing information, but think about us all being connected as a species, um, much like the robots. I mean, this, this has been totally in the realm of science fiction, and now uh, we have to think about it. And um, you know the term cyborg. A cyborg is a part human, part machine. It was a term that was coined by NASA in 1961. And, uh, you also have seen Star Trek probably and know about the Borg, resistance is futile, you will be assimilated. I think we have to be really careful about the way we connect this technology to us. If we're gonna uh, offer humans intellectual prosthesis, you know, things that, it's important that they be able to take them off. Um, because I think our humanity is about our independence and if we're all interconnected, it might be some better thing, but it won't be about humanity. I got into this book um, thinking about the question of um, what's our relationship going to be with these machines a decade from now and how can we make it a good one and not a destructive one. And I came away from the book thinking it's not an open and shut case, but the, the, the reason to be optimistic is it's a human choice how we design these machines. And, uh, I think we can uh, we can we can go in two different directions. You know, we can make machines that are incredibly destructive. We can make machines that surveil us, um, take away our privacy, kill us, or we can we can build machines that that you know care for aging humans, um, help surgeons do a better job, help lawyers make better decisions. So there are two directions, and the the reason I'm optimistic is it comes down to a human choice, and. I think that there's a possibility the machines may make society much better.